if you were on with us last weekend on Saturday, you noticed that there was a little bit of a glitch with audio. So um, I, I was requesting that you guys let us know how is the sound. I've got my intern Joey, and yesterday we did a lot of uh, experimentation with microphones and cameras and all kinds of equipment. So if you can hear me okay, please uh, just say, yeah, the sound is good. No, the sound isn't good. Okay, great. There's one sound that's good. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Chris. Oh, you're one of our uh, grand prize winners. Good to see you on the call. Um, Debbie, thank you. And uh, Matt, thank you. All right, great. Awesome. Okay, I think I'm going to get started one minute before 2 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Thanks, everybody, for uh, taking out time on your valuable weekend to join me here. I'm very motivated by the questions that have been coming in that you've been um, submitting via that link that will always be in every description under every video that I have. Um, we can submit questions for YouTube because uh, when I read those questions, I, I just want to like answer them, but obviously I can't answer them all at one time and there, there are literally hundreds of questions. So for today, what I did, I just real quickly, I want to tell you that I went through them and I kind of categorized them in terms of like process and technique color, um, materials, and so I'm going to get, get started right now and just tell you uh, that I'm going to be answering as many questions as I can as I am also painting. And this act, by the way, is a challenge that um, it came from two sources. One is our Watch, Learn, Grow membership group, and so Marie Cove in Norway submitted this fabulous challenge, which was to work on a black gesso ground. Okay, so I hadn't done that yet, and I thought, okay, this is a great time to try it. And then I saw another challenge come in um, from another person saying, hey, can you work on a black underpainting? So I want to explain that this is Strathmore mixed media uh, paper. And it's six feet by, I guess, about maybe four feet. And it's just, it's just paper, and it's adhered to the wall with, uh, you know, white tape. You know, if you use blue tape, that, that doesn't really matter, except you want to make sure it's kind of tacky enough that your painting's not going to fall off the wall. And I last night, before the YouTube Live, I covered this with black, not just black paint, black gesso. I want to show you this. Um, it's in a jug, and this is made by Nova Color. Some of you have been asking me, uh, where do I get my acrylic paint? Why are they so like nice and fluid, right? Um, Nova Color, actually listed on my resource page at artandsuccess.com. I get them in gallon jugs. Um, they're more like buckets. And then I move them into a, a gallon container because it's much easier to just have a small cap poured into a container than to work out of a bucket. I find buckets to be really tough. So you'll find on my artandsuccess.com in the resource section, even these gallon containers. Like I list everything that I ordered there because I don't want to have to search for it. So I put all the links there and I just share that with you guys. Um, so if you ever want to find stuff that you see I'm using, it's almost all there. Okay, so I want to show you the black gesso. The reason I covered this with black gesso is because at first I wasn't sure today and uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to be working acrylic or in cold wax medium. So I thought, ah, oh, you know, and I started to read more of the questions and I saw people asking about pigment sticks, RNF pigment sticks, those are oil based. Uh, people were starting to ask me about cold wax medium and getting the drippy paint. So I started to think, okay, I've seen a lot of questions that have to do with yes, acrylic, but also oil and cold wax medium. So um, as I go through these questions, I started to categorize them and I decided that for this, for today, because there'll be hopefully many future YouTube lives based on your questions, keep them coming because that's really important, um, that today I'm going to be working on this Strathmore mixed media paper. It has black gesso, not paint, gesso, that's different. The difference between black paint and black gesso is that any anytime you have something that has the word gesso in it, it means it's absorbent. It means that it's a ground and underpainting for moving into oil and cold wax or acrylic. I could go either way at this point, but based on the questions I was getting, um, and, and since I've done some acrylic um, YouTube videos recently, the, the large scale ones, I thought, okay, today I'm gonna work into oil and cold wax medium and show you some of these special effects, okay? Um, but 
Also, the reason I'm choosing black is because that was part of this challenge that Marie Ho from Norway had. And it's how do you start with like a black underpainting? Okay, so I'm just going to start moving into this and I will explain as I go. Um, by the way, congratulations to Chris Starst, who's on live today. Uh, I don't know if Mike Locus is on today, but um, Chris Starst was one of the grand prize winners. He's in San Francisco. I want to read this to you real quick. I chose him as a winner for the. Um, professional grade gambling oil paint set because he said, he wrote, Hi Pam, I'm a sculptor, but after a few months of watching your videos, I'm retooling my studio to give cold wax a try. My art focus is social justice, and I would like to weave that into this medium. I'm wondering if insinuating text within the multiple layers of paint is possible. What would you suggest? So, and then the other grand prize winner in the other YouTube video I did that was for challenges was by Mike Locus from Canton, Ohio, and he wanted, you know, he had a very long description of the challenge, and I'm going to be doing that in the future, but it had to do with geometry, and I thought that was very intriguing because I love geometry. So in answer to Chris's question, um, the idea of text um, within multiple layers of paint is it possible? Absolutely. Um, the beauty of, you know, when you're painting, uh, you can get any effect you want. Don't let anything ever stop you if you're a realist painter, if you're a you know, impressionist painter or anything else. Um, whatever you want to do, whatever you strive to do, um, there, there is, um, is going to be a solution. It's just up to you to find it. So if text is important to you, Chris, then you, know, you might actually make your own stencils. This one happens to be a manufactured one, but I recently actually got a stencil making machine so I could make my own stencils, and that's pretty cool. Now this one's a store-bought one, but if you have text you want to incorporate, you can either like make yourself a stencil, um, it can be made out of newsprint, newsprint um, plastic, whatever. This one's just plastic, but again, yes, absolutely, there's there's nothing you can't do. So I wanted to show you too that I applied this black gesso here. Um, again, this is white paper, and I used this roller, a sponge roller, to take the black gesso and put it on here. So it set overnight and it dries. Many people think acrylic dries super fast, but actually letting it dry overnight or even a couple of days is recommended by Golden. Uh, Golden is a major manufacturer of uh, acrylic products because even when paint appears to be dry, it may be drying the surface, but not necessarily cured yet. So, but this is gesso and it dries pretty fast. You'll notice here there's a little white puddle. What that is, you'll notice that I didn't cover the entire thing with black. I actually left some white space, but because I'm planning on moving into oil and cold wax, this morning I put clear gesso. Again, the clear gesso I use is made by Liquitex. I don't know many companies who make clear gesso. The reason I wanted clear and not black, not white, was because, I mean, I wanted the shape, so clear was, was what I did. So that's what I used. Um, all right, so hmm, I think I'm not really sure what the dilemma is. like. Black brown, white brown, I'm not really sure why that matters too much. Like in my world, I don't really think that matters a whole lot. Um, because it is dark though, I do know that like my art of pigment sticks here, if I do something like this, right, you're going to see it, um, obviously. If I do it on white, you're not going to see it. That's obvious, you know. Um, I think mostly what happens when, when we start talking about working on a black ground versus a white ground, we are starting to really talk about value. And value is something that I talk a lot about in my course. So if you guys are in my course, you know that. If you're on this um, YouTube live, you, you know that um, I talk a lot about it. Now here's a mid-tone gray. So again, here's white. Now I can do this, and it's going to show. The difference between the two is, is, you know, not that great because this is actually a kind of a high key gray, meaning it's fairly light. But I can just, you know, now that this is um, black gesso on paper, I can pretend that, you know, it, or I don't, it, it's just fine to now work in oil and cold wax medium. Now these Arnett pigment sticks are, I'd say like, you know, 80% oil, a very small amount of beeswax. So, there's a lot of oil paint in these. They do take longer to dry. But um, I always, I, I love to use them. They are a gestural tool. So for those of you who like marks, right, anything goes. Um, again, but, and then last Saturday I talked to you about these 
sweeping arm movements. It's very important that, you know, this may not be as big as the one I did last Saturday, but it's still big enough where it doesn't, you know, whatever it is, get, you need to get a feel for what you're, what you're working on. I'm not paying attention to what's black or what's white, except for that if I have a light um, mark making tool like this gray, I know that it's going to show up better against dark. And uh, if I have something dark, like let's say I'll grab some of my usual favorites here. I've got a, a chunky charcoal, I've got a Rembrandt Lyra, and my favorite is the Stabilo 8046. These are finer tipped, right? But I know that the black is not going to show up against this, and there's no point in making any marks there. But if I go like this, now you see it. So the whole thing about value, um, whether you work on a, a dark brown or a light brown is that, you know, what's going to show? So in your head, you're not really thinking, I am not thinking. This is, this is part of my process in play. I'm not trying to think, but I, even if I'm not thinking, I know that, you know, if I were like three years old, I probably would be able to start to, to see that if I put this, which is dark over light, I'm going to see it. And if I'm free and I do this, I'm not going to see it. So that's really the only amount of thing that I'm thinking at this point. This is the play stage, and I'm just going to have fun. Now, um, I got a lot of questions about materials. So I'm just going to start to address things like that. Um, and by the way, this, this is actually um, a little on the side, but this is my um, Masterson. Uh, stay wet palette. And I just want to show you, my husband was nice enough to make me this lid. Um, these are my oil paints. Okay, so some of you are asking, can you store mixed paint, you know, oil paint that's mixed with cold wax medium and galga gel. Um, I had to make this lid for me because I had a really hard time with the plastic lid to, to get on here. And I do have um, this spongy layer. That, this is like an optional thing, but I like it. What I do is I kind of soak it with Gamsol on the very bottom. Then I put my palette paper, there's the oil, the cold wax medium, and I actually had two layers of paint in here. Then I put the lid on, it's just a custom made lid that's made out of wood with a handle. And I do store in the refrigerator if I'm not gonna get back to it right away. So if you have a dedicated refrigerator where there's no food, you're okay. I just wanted to throw that in there. And um, so some of you are asking about, um, so Chris, Abshire from Washington, LaConnor, Washington. She wants to know sources for large, good quality paper. Ian Trott of Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, wants to know preference for paper versus canvas versus cradle board. So I'm going to just address all that really quickly. If you are an acrylic or um, oil and cold wax medium artist, this is what I'm using today. This is Strathmore mixed media paper comes in a roll, you know, and, and it, there's a lot of paper on here. So this is a brand new roll last night. I opened it up, put it on the floor, laid it out, weighted it down with um, these gallon jugs of paint, cut it, uh, and here it is. So this is on my website, artandsuccess.com, uh, under the resource section, because I use it a lot. I ordered a lot. Um, here's another one. This is um, Strathmore heavyweight drawing paper. Again, any paper can be coated with gesso and become a great ground for acrylic or oil and cold wax medium. It's your choice. Those are my two like go-to papers. Then this is my um, arches, oil, cold wax medium. And the reason uh, when it comes very tightly rolled, and uh, you've seen it in another video where I'm trying to unroll this thing, and the thing like wants to snap back into that really tight tight roll. So my friend Jane Canyon in Vancouver, who I think endlessly for telling me this little secret. Notice the concrete form here, and it, it's got a large diameter. If you wrap the paper in the reverse way that it wants to be, eventually it relaxes and you, it's not fighting you and like slapping you in the face when you unroll it. So that's why I keep my arches to cold wax medium paper, my arches is soil paper. I love, I love that as well. Okay, so again, on my re your resource section is right. Everything that I use is there, and you can find it there. Um, now, a lot of you had questions about color, so I've just done some initial mark making, again, on a black ground, and uh, some of you are asking questions about color. Um, Anne 
four of Cincinnati, Ohio says, I'm a novice. Um, my colors become muddy. Um, how do you know? Let's see. How do I avoid this? So let's talk about mud because mud, no matter what medium you're working in, I think we can all agree that it, at one time or another we've had mud. Now your definition of mud and my definition of mud are probably different because, well, I, you know, like 20 years ago, I, I would have said, oh my gosh, I've got mud. Now it's like mud. Okay. That's great. I'm going to make a mud and I'm going to show you why there's actually, there is to me in my world, there is no such thing as mud. I'm starting with the dark gray. I'm adding some red and I'm just going to add a lot of colors. My mixed palette today is alizarin orange, sorry, Indian yellow made by Gamblin. Um, I've got some cad red over here, but that's more like a, a special color. My other, so I, I'm trying to keep my palette simple today. I've got ultramarine blue. And this is um, oil with cold wax medium and delicate gel. I'm going to just work really hard to make some, something that you might call mud. Here's a little bit of black. And, you know, it's going to get really gross. I think that our idea of mud is when it goes greenish. Because green is... The combination green is what happens. <laughs> this is like an army green now. It's actually really deep. And let me just show you here. Um, when when we get mud, basically what's happening is we're you know we're not we're not caring too much about what we're doing in, in a way, or maybe we don't know. It could be one or the other. But in my case, it's usually I don't care. So you might have violet, blue, green, yellow, and red, and throw them all in your palette. And what you're going to get is in the middle. That says neutral gray. Well, neutral gray is another word for kind of like mud. Mud can go like it can be a reddish mud color. I'll use the word mud because that's the word we're talking about right now. Here is the mud I just mixed up. And, if, you know, you might think that this is, is awful. But to me, I didn't mix it very well, but it's an army green. Okay, and I might say, oh, my gosh, that's mud. So um, this viewer is saying, how do I avoid mud? Well, I don't think it's a matter of avoiding mud because you're going to get mud. It's more a question of what do you do with mud once you get our lips? What do you do with a neutral gray? It's actually a very neutral gray, a little bit greenish gray, as opposed to a gray that's just black and white with no color added to it. So um, the way to look at any mud is that it's actually an acid, not a liability. And the reason is that... Um, I'm going to grab some of these Arnott pigment sticks and a crayon and just a bright color here of Maribou crayon. Okay, so here's green. Actually, this one hasn't even been opened yet. Okay, now it's open. I want to show you what happens when you've got this, what is supposedly mud, and you're unhappy with it. It's the perfect thing to put some saturation next to, okay? Because um, you know, this against black is one thing, but when it's next to the gray, this gray muddy section, um, you know, in some ways your painting kind of comes alive. Now here's red, right? And here's a pink. So I'm not really paying too much attention to these colors. Um, well, I should say that I, I'm going to keep track. I'm going to use this. It's like a little swatch, and I want to show you that if I start to go nuts with Color. Here's a, you just saw me add red, and here's a little crayon. I haven't added that yet. Here's green. If, if you take a color swatch and you keep track of the colors that you throw into your paint, I don't care how many, it could be three, it could be 10, or it could be 20, but keep a swatch and then, you know, if I had, if I wasn't doing live here, I would be labeling what these are, but I know what they are because they're still on my table. Here's a lizard orange. I'm going to be using that. Uh, here's a little bit of cadmium red medium. I'm going to use that. Okay. So you're, you're just going to keep track of the colors that you're using. That's really important, okay? Because you're kind of, uh, and we'll explain this later, it's important. So today's demo is kind of all uh, a lot of color. But in answer to the mud question, just look at mud as the perfect contrast to bright colors. If you don't have mud, your colors won't look as bright and vibrant. So it's the contrast between dull and bright, dull and bright. Anything that you think of um, that's mud, and here's the swatch, by the way, um, can be used to your advantage. So 
terms like mud and another comment I got, like my left brain is always saying that what I'm doing is ugly um, or it's not good. All these things have to do with just not quite understanding how to turn that language around into something positive. So our left brain is more than happy to make us feel like we're not good artists and nothing's working and I'm really unhappy and again, that whole, that whole negative like spiral. But to empower yourself against that negative um, person sitting on your left shoulder is to just, you need to understand the visual language of art. That is a, a universal language. It doesn't matter, you know, it's not like French or English or Spanish or German. It's not. It's, it's actually universal language. So that's why, um, that's what I teach in my course, this universal language, because you need it to combat the negative talk. So I've got all these grays and, you know, the limited palette that I have here, here's just like, here's another thing you might call mud, right? It's kind of a mauve color. I had this left over from another demo I did um, last weekend. Now, the value difference, if you squint, um, it is hard to see color in terms of value, which means how white or dark it is. But um, if I squint, um, I can see that's the mid-tone, and then this is black, and that's white. So we're really going to simplify values down to three, three uh, individual areas. White, black, and then some, something in between it. That's about as simple as you can get. Uh, okay, so in terms of color, um, that was Anne's question about my colors become muddy. Leslie K from Toronto, Ontario, Ontario asked about what's the best way to learn color theory. There are many, many books. Um, I taught at the university level. I taught the foundations in 2D color and design. And um, yeah, there's some, some books, but I have to say the book that I was teaching from that I was told this is your curriculum. Um, I wasn't really happy with it, and so I kind of tried to, I started to order books on eBay that were used. Um, I found a couple good ones, uh, but there weren't many. I, I, again, it's, it is very hard actually to find a good book sometimes on color. So, um, I mean, some of the best things you can do are just paint, right? And another thing I'd recommend is to use a limited palette. So today my two main colors are ultramarine blue and this Indian yellow, made by Gamblin. Both Gamblin colors. Now notice when I go over the white, and I've got a roller here, a brayer, and it's going over the gesso. So that's why it's, you know, there's a little bit of um, tension and friction between the gesso and this cold wax medium and oil. It's not quite as smooth as if it were, say, an ampersand panel, but um, it's still, the good thing about it is I don't have to worry about it falling off the surface. Um, if this were just an acrylic painting, and I've had that actually happen where if I didn't put the clear gesso on, you know, it might flake, it might chip. And even though that might be a remote thing, not guaranteed to happen, I just didn't want to take that chance. So that is why I take that extra step of using the um, clear gesso again here. And I, again, in this one, I only put the clear gesso over the white area. So another question. Um, uh, yeah, okay, well, Doug Spencer had another great question on choosing colors. Again, I think that the best thing, if you guys are feeling overwhelmed by color, is to greatly simplify your choices. Um, if you saw my palette here, you'd see that I have black, I have white, and I have really basically two other colors. One is this Indian yellow, and one is French Open Blue. So even though I did these pigment sticks just as a demo, they're not really part of my palette. Those are kind of like the spice colors, like cayenne pepper on a meal or something like that. So when I talk about a simplified palette, if you guys are struggling with color, keep it simple. Like um, in my course, I teach that colors that are directly opposite each other are complementary. We also have triads, like the one you grew up with in kindergarten, the yellow, the red, and the blue. That's a primary triad. There's also a secondary triad. So then, you know, there's the orange, the violet, and the green, that would be the secondary palette. So keep it simple. You, you don't really ever need to have more than two or three colors, colors plus black and white. And then the black and white give you this extraordinary um, tints, tone, and shade. Um, color theory is just not, you know, it, it, it seems really complex, but actually it's not, doesn't have to be that way. So that's one of the things I was on a mission to let people know that color does not have to be complicated. So, all right. Um, Oh, by the way, through the end of August, in my course, for those of you who might be on this call, 
if you guys are learning from the course and are enjoying it, um, please just type something in the box like, yeah, I'm learning a lot about color. I'm learning a lot about design. For those who are not in the course yet, I'm offering 25% off. Um, again, to the end of August. And this is the website you can go to. It's right here. Um, I have an extra domain name that points you to my art and success.com website. It's um, loveyourarts.com. And when you go there, you're going to get $150 off the course. So I just like to let you know that. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about artists getting this information. We all come from different backgrounds. So this course is meant to kind of help every artist regardless of where you're from. Um, so that's the color discussion. We've talked about materials. Now I want to get into some technical questions about working with oil and cold wax medium. So I'm going to jump right into this question that I seem to get when I go to workshops. Um, it's really great because people love um, the idea of making oil and cold wax medium act like the acrylics you love. Like acrylics are fluid and they, you know, they can dry fast and they're, they can get drippy effects and all those things. So I have a bottle here, it's empty now, and I've labeled it. So if you want to label a bottle when you're going to start mixing stuff. This says one to one, Galkid and Gamsol. What are those things, right? Um, if you want to get drippy cold wax medium, then, um, and I spoke with Gamblin, so this is this is their suggestion. Um, this is their Gamsol. It's the um, safest, most effective, odorless mineral spirit on the market. And what you're going to do is take a bottle empty like this and clean. And just, just put them in there. You don't need a lot. I'm going to put like maybe an inch, okay? You're just eyeballing it. Okay, so then cap this guy, take it out of the way. Now, you have a choice. Um, Gamblin makes Galkid Light. They also make another product that looks just like this, but it's called Galkid. Either one is fine. One has slightly more Gamsol in it. So um, that doesn't really matter. Um, what, you, what this is, is a resin product. And it's going to combine with your Gamsol. So here's Galkid, here's Gamsol. I want these one to one for 50 50. So I'm going to eyeball it. If here's about an inch, I want it to go to the bottom. I've got a little icon on my bottle here. And it's right at about that um, one inch mark or two inch mark, I should say. So here I go, pouring it in. Okay. So there it is, one to one and cap everything. And by the way, if you have a Galkid product, you want to um, make sure the lid's on tightly and then store it upside down. This is something I cover um, in my course, but this is gonna prevent it from, um, like it keeps oxygen from getting in here and entering it into a gel. All right, so I'm just gonna store this over here. And now you want to like kind of mix this up, right? So again, we're working toward, toward getting drippy, drippy paint and put the lid on and just sort of like fix it. In here, I've got some titanium white, coal wax medium, and it does have this galca gel in there, but that's because I mix it with everything, all of my paint. So now you can add this to your paint. I'm just gonna pour it in there. And I'm gonna pour it in there until I think it's the consistency that I want. So that's kind of like, well, what do you want, right? How much drippiness do you want? I can also add color to it. So let's see, what do I have here? I've got, I've got white, I've got a little bit of um, Indian yellow. Um, I might add just a little bit of, um, maybe a little bit of blue. Okay, so here's my white. You kind of see that. It's very liquid now. And again, I'm just eyeballing it. I'm in a little bit of this um, blue. And go just very, very high key blue. Barely enough. So I add a little bit more. And this is just an empty cottage cheese container. All right. So once you've got that mixed up, you know, it's just a lovely mixture. As you can see how um, just coming off my bachelor tip, you know, the amount of drippiness. And you have full control over how drippy you want it. Maybe you don't want it that drippy. That's totally up to you. So then uh, I like to, you know, you guys, if you've seen my videos, um, I do like these long handle brushes. I also have this um, crazy one that I've used in acrylic. This is just a cheap old 25 cent rod I got from the hardware store. I mean, if I was standing really far away, I could actually like, um, all right, so here's my brush. 
And I'm just going to like dip it in here and I want to show you that um, the play stage for me is all about lack of control. You can't do anything wrong, and I'll just keep reiterating that. Um, so, here, go for your hands. Um, have to step on your floor, especially if you're working in your living room. But um, again, it's all like you guys were asking about marketing, right? Um, so the thing about a rod like this is that it takes control away from you. Um, look, I'm setting gravity. The thing about taking control away from you is that it allows you to be, you know, your left brain's going to tune out. Your left brain's going to be like, you know, I am not interested in what you are doing because it's just not logical to me. And your left brain will be rather severe, like, you know, why don't you do something that's nice? Why don't you do something that's pretty? I don't like that. That's what your left brain's saying. But again, if you understand the visual language of art, uh, you realize that the things you are doing, actually, um, you can define them. These are marks. These are curvilinear marks. They're high C, which means they're life valued. They've gone from rather opaque to, and let's say that the edge is hard, to an edge that is broken. Not really amorphous. I'll show you what an amorphous edge is. But when you start to talk in terms of the visual language, you're kind of uh, sort of telling your left brain that you know what you're doing, but it's a different language that your left brain just doesn't comprehend. That's why it's so important to understand that everything you do at any stage, at any time, if you can describe it in terms that are um, positive, so if I have a positive attitude, well, how do I do that? Well, you do that by increasing your understanding and knowledge of the, um, of the visual language of art. And I can, you know, again, I can take the silicone tool and get it to drip. Again, you try all different kinds of tools and anything goes, can't do anything wrong. But notice how it's dripping. And, you know, if I wanted this to be more drippy, I would have added more of that solution. But, uh, you know, I like drips and it's a very different kind of mark. So, the visual language of art is saying, oh, okay, well, these are some, it's kind of a pattern, it's kind of a rhythm set up, and it's gravity that's pulling your strip marks down. And, um, and then up here, it's a little bit semi-transparent, semi-opaque. Here, it's more opaque. Here, it's transparent. So that's what you want to start doing is analyzing what you have done. Like, this is actually quite opaque, this pink, right? But what if I take... Um, just straight Gamsol, which is where I could take 50-50. So the 50-50 solution is actually quite valuable because you can then, again, ventilation is a good idea. But if I put it on this pigment stick, look. Now, I could just do this without the 50-50 and see how much it moves. It's going to move differently. Notice how that's different than adding liquid to this. Because adding liquid to that kind of makes it into almost a wash-like effect. So if you're a watercolorist or if you're liking that, that drippiness uh, in your acrylic paint. And I do feel the, the bit of texture on the, um, the black gesso because it's kind of gritty. Um, but you can actually do a lot of different things with oil and cold wax medium to mimic the things that you care about. So um, in terms of you know, again, more ideas of talking in a positive way about what's happening. Um, you've got hard edges. This would be called an amorphous edge here. Um, and then, you know, we've got some things that are uh, curvilinear, some things that are more rectilinear, and you kind of straight up and down. So by working on a dark ground, uh, obviously the lighter marks are really going to show. And I didn't really work into this blue yet. So I'm going to take my Messer Meister tool here. And let's start to add some of this. Again, it was a limited palette, but because I started to show you guys some other things, like the green and the pink, let's say that's not what I wanted, or I just want to obliterate it. So now, I can come over this, and look what happens. I mean, this blue going over this pink, like, what happens? That's why you really have to ask yourself, like, what if, what if I do this? That's really the only thing you need to be asking yourself right now. Um, I will say that, I, again, I think art is a science because uh, science simply means it's a study, a study of something 
Well, you are definitely in your studio studying something, you're studying color, you're studying shape, you're studying texture, and all those things. So again, um, look at how versatile this is. I can put it on, I can actually take it off again. Um, I can obliterate the paint, but I can also reveal it at the same time. And that's just an art of pigment stick. It didn't go anywhere. Um, here is that murky, muddy color. We're calling it mud because that was the term that I know a lot of people use. But actually, look what happens. I'm not really glazing over it, but I'm kind of just brushing over it. And if I peel it back, I can kind of change the nature of that sort of um, gray down color. I'll call it gray down color now. And mixing occurs on the actual painting. So if I bring this up, you know, let's say it fits the white area like here. Well, if it goes over the white and I peel it back, I haven't lost that shape. The shape is still there, but the value has not changed. I can do the same thing down here. Maybe that was just too vibrant white. And I can peel it back here. So now I haven't lost the shape. It's just gone to another value. And, you know, so what you're doing here is you're building up layers. A lot of things like layers. Some of you say, um, I get the ugly stage, I have no trouble with that. But then I start to I start to identify things I like, and then I've lost all my ugly stage. And then you want some of that to show through. Well, I can relate to that. So what I've done is I usually will then um, superimpose over ugly, like a pattern, something with rhythm, something that can be done. And like I've done stripes before, I've done you know patterns, circles, things like that. Because what happens is then you're um, randomly covering up ugly without being like, I'm gonna cover up ugly here, here, and here. No, it's dictated by the pattern you've chosen. So if it's stripes and you've got a stripe here, no stripe, stripe, no stripe, wherever there's no stripe, you've said, I'm gonna let ugly show, right? So that's kind of why I like to juxtapose pattern with chaos because it allows me to not objectively um, obliterate things that I might otherwise have a hard time letting go of. And I, I know there's a big feeling of not wanting to lose those things that are precious, but if they're in the wrong place, they're not kind of compositionally um, working, then you may love it, but if it's in the wrong place, you kind of have to just let go. So by superimposing something with pattern or structure or something about structure, you're kind of in a very random way letting go. And it's easier to let go that way. If I can take straight cold wax medium as well and just like use that also to kind of make this edge more amorphous. As long as you treat everything in this medium in the same way, like it's the same cold wax medium and Yalkid uh, ratio, I can make this um, mark here get a different edge quality because I mean this is like uninterrupted and all of a sudden boom now it's turned into this amorphous edge and that's just a nice variation coming over this white shape by catching the edge I no longer have parted it's all the way around now it's kind of got a bit of a soft edge here so you want to just like vary things as much as you possibly can and again, I'm not standing back from this. Um, another person asked me if I hadn't been doing a demo last weekend on Saturday, would I have paused more? Would I have stopped and you know maybe given it time to um, set up because I'm working on oil and cold wax medium? To be honest with you, I'm just gonna do this real quick for this is for the audio. Okay, sorry about that. I know it's a lot, but. Um, I wouldn't have done anything differently last weekend if you guys hadn't been here. And I don't really know why, um, why my brain works the way it does. All I know is that I'm just playing and whether I'm like in front of you guys or I'm just like alone or if I'm just playing or whatever, because in this stage I'm not thinking very, I'm not thinking at all. Um, I, my demo would have been, I mean, if, if you guys aren't watching, I would have been doing the very same thing. But the question was, would I have stood back and let this dry and sit up? And if I did, how long? So because I'm working in this wet medium and I'm working wet into wet, um, actually in answer to her question, I'd love to work wet into wet. So that wouldn't have changed. Um, at some point though, when you work wet into wet, 
it becomes, you get to a point where you can't do anything anymore. So that's when you stop. You have to be aware in this medium when that point happens or just deal with the result of maybe going a little bit beyond where you have control. So you might lose control. So the reason I like wet into wet is because it's uh, going to vary in edge quality a lot. And I'm just going to add some model print here. Here's my piece of paper. And I'd like to just tear it along an edge. So if I wanted to sort of put some more shapes on here that are kind of random, again, I can take a you take a pigment stick, but I think what I'll do instead, well, actually, I'll take a pigment stick. This is a very light titanium pink white. Um, all right. Yeah, guys, if, if the audio is better than last weekend, could you please let us know? Because we would really like to make sure that you can hear everything. And I appreciate your feedback. That was one reason why we wanted to do this again and see if we can uh, correct. Um, thanks for all your feedback, by the way, because that was actually really helpful. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm just making kind of a, a shape that maybe you could consider to be part rectilinear, um, but it's, it's a goofy shape. So I like goofy shapes. Um, all right, I'm looking where I can. It's a white. It's a white. Titanium white. So where we can show up. It's not. And I don't want to put it into something like drippy wet. How about here? Um, this and this is mono print. You can use a brayer, but you can use your hand. And I like I like pigment sticks on like freezer paper, pellet paper, wax paper because of the mark it makes. Now this is a mark you just can't get any other way. I love that mark. <laughs> um, look at the if you if you're up close, the textural um, this this kind of texture you can't get any other way. Look at how different this texture is from that texture. And then look at how different this texture is from Mark's, okay? And look at how different this is from that. And that's what you're really in the play stage. You're just like, what can I throw at this that I haven't done yet? I mean, that's the only thing I'm thinking of. That's more than a child would think, but um, not that much more. But here I've got um, this chunky thing on the bottom. I'm gonna turn it upside down and go off the edge. Um, by the way, um, I'm gonna do a post probably do a post-edit version of today's live and then um, because there are a lot of questions that I, I won't be able to get to today um, and I, but I really want to answer them so number one please keep those questions coming please comment in the box below um, you know like and comment and, and subscribe and all those good things if you don't mind because it just makes me you know you're out there and that you like the live videos because I don't know if people like them um, I'm going to grab some gray here and mix it with this yellow, notice how it's over here. I had a question come in by a person who was interesting because she was asking about, she gets a little confused by this, this law of thirds. Um, and I know I've kind of heard that, but I don't think I've ever been really taught that. So I wasn't really sure what that meant, except that I think the comparison is repetition, right? So the reason we want, I'm guessing the reason for that type of a rule, which I don't really like to think about as any rule, there are no real rules. Their principles, but once you know them, then you can you can veer away from them. But again, here I'm going to take this color on this, the shiny side of the freezer paper, and I think what she's getting at is notice. Can you see how lopsided the paint is because it's got this warm cast here, but it's nowhere else. That's a problem. If I were to call this painting finished, which of course it isn't, but if I did, it'd be like, but but there's only this, so that doesn't work. You have to, repetition is what leads to unity, okay? So um, I can draw my fingers to that. Okay, now there's some warm there at least. Um, your eye's gonna notice what there's the least amount of. If warm is only there, your eye's gonna go there and it's not gonna even go anywhere else for painting until much, much later. Um, here, and I've got it here, here, and if I put it here, and just sort of do that draining thing again, just because it's fun. I like that. I love that the weird edge you get. It's just great. Um, okay. Now I've repeated it three times. So it's kind of a balance thing. And let's say I take some of this dark maroon color and throw it onto here. 
again, this, this idea of repetition. So repetition can be either with or without variety. If it's without variety, you've got work like Amos Martin. A lot of people love her work, but her work is not varied. She's got like ribs that don't have any variation a lot of times. Now, but we can also have repetition with variation. So if I do this and I add this color, move it around. Okay, I can this color. There is red here, probably smack dab in the middle, which is a thing that happens to me. But I can take my pigment stick, which is where I started that mark, and let's just say that it feels very central, and I can't really see it. Um, but if I pick up this mark, and I, I can offset that feeling of center. Okay, so now, not only is it pulling away from center, but it's also repeating the sense of red here, right? I can do this and add some, some uh, cat red to that. And now it's kind of like boom, boom, and maybe it was just like that. And now, I don't know what this last there is, but I'm guessing that that's kind of what it's about is um, repetition leads to unity. You've got repetition with variation or without variation. Without variation, it's kind of static. With variation, it's got um, you know more character. So right, here's a light blue. Um, it's really an extra pale, it's really an extra pale. It's actually very much like this. Notice how I mix that color, the drippy paint, and it's just slightly lighter than this color. So I can, the, the beauty of RNF pigment sticks is the gestural quality. So the last thing I want to do, if I don't have to, and I have other options, is to take this and take my palette knife and mush it onto my, my freezer paper and add cold wax medium. Why? Because these are really expensive. They're and they're meant to be for drawing, you know, gestural things. So I'm not going to like want to convert this into like a pile of paint. I'm going to use a tube of paint for that. I'm going to save my RNF pigment sticks for when it really matters. Usually that's toward the end, but not necessarily. It can be at any time as long as it's kind of like, you know, it's a gestural mark. And um, notice when it goes into wet into wet here, it still maintains its integrity. Here it went through red. And it mixed a little bit. I'm changing the quality of the line. I've gotten really thin now and off. So um, I love these RNF pigment sticks. They're really great. And I've got an oil bar, which is a Windsor Newton. This is the white. In the other videos, I've been using the black like crazy. But I only have I had like ten of these and one white. I've not used the white yet. So and I can't really see what's going on in this room, but um, I do see that there's white here. There's white there, and those are kind of even. Um, and I don't really like me even that is I don't like perfect symmetry. So I'm going to just like pull this white down a little bit and see what happens. That's different. Now let's say that I just didn't like that because I really don't. Um, not that it matters because I'm, I'm not really going to be too concerned with that. But um, so you can change something that you don't like pretty quickly. Uh, let's see. I think we could do some more. We need more of that clear medium yellow. Let's take my mess canister. Just take a little. Let's see what happens. This is a glaze, um, meaning that it has a higher oil content. It does take a little bit longer for it to dry. But now that I put this white here, and it's wet, but um, this is a glaze. Okay, so I can pretty much change the value of these fishes. I can actually probably lift them pretty much of that off. But um, just by going back and forth, I'm obviously adding this very saturated and thin transparent color. So I think if you don't like something that's happening, even in the play stage, just keep keep going with it and add more color, lift some off. Um, you know, if you're really not liking it, then you know your decisions, the thinking part comes later. You don't have to worry about it now. Just make the observation, like just making that observation. You know what I really don't like? That actually is a good observation, but then again, you can kind of lift and maybe I don't like how much I lifted, you put it back. And then you could take, oh, there's so many tools. So 
so many great tools. I think this guy, this is just um, a catalyst tool. I know a lot of people have those, but um, you can pull it through here. So then there's kind of a repetition of stripe here and here. Um, okay, so that kind of gives you an idea. All right, so let's see if I have any other questions on here that I haven't answered yet. Okay, so Kathy Mellett of Ann Arbor, Michigan, says she falls in love, love with the RNF pigment sticks, but she's been using them on acrylic and probably not using that acrylic on uh, clear gesso. And she's wondering, do I foresee any problems with technique? They're talking about technical problems such as peeling, color changing, never drying, et cetera. Um, I think it kind of depends on a lot of different factors. Um, you know, how thick and glossy is your acrylic paint? How transparent and thick is your RNF pigment stick? What are your environmental conditions? Is it really humid? That, that's why I do kind of like, for me personally, I like to use that uh, clear gesso because then I don't have to worry about all those different variables. Um, I'm pretty sure that if I use that clear gesso, the absorbency is going to make sure that the oil added on top of an acrylic, um, due to the fact that the uh, gesso is gritty, it's like sandpaper, you can feel it, it's like sandpaper, it's very absorbent, that armless pigment stick or anything else is not going to go anywhere. But I do think, on the other hand, that if you're not using a whole lot of RNF pigment stick, you're probably okay. I can't imagine that that color is just going to fall off. But again, what you can do on your acrylic painting before you do the RNF pigment stick is you can take sandpaper, and I did do this before I, I started using the clear gesso, and I took kind of a rough sandpaper and I roughed up the surface, because what you're trying to do is knock the shine back on your acrylic so that... Um, that in itself has made the surface, if you looked at that through a microscope, it'd be like a lot more textured. And that textured surface of the acrylic is gonna be a much better surface for the paint stick or anything else you do on it um, than if you didn't do that. So, yeah, so thank you for joining me. I'm, I think that I've shown you almost everything I, I really wanted to show you today. Um, I guess one, one last thing I'll just say in closing here, somebody asked me about surfaces to work on Aside from the paper, um, there are cradle panels. Again, these are, you know, cradle means that it's got um, the wooden top, but it's also got like this side, and it means that you can hang it on a wall, like on a couple of nails, or have a wire going across it. I love working on panels. Um, somebody asked me if you'd like paper versus panel. Um, multimedia artboard is also wonderful. Um, it's very good because look at it, it comes in a lot of different sizes, and you can pack it your suitcase. Um, and it's uh, you do not have to treat this with gesso. It's ready to go for acrylic or oils. This, you have to treat with gesso for acrylic and oils. You can't just start painting on this unless it's encaustic. And then another favorite of mine is encaustic board made by Ampersand. So I'll be, uh, we'll be using these in New York. Um, and these are, I love the surface so much because it's just really, um, receptive to things like oil and cold wax medium. So I want to thank everybody for joining me today. And again, I appreciate your questions and your comments, um, your likes, your subscribing to my channel and uh, your feedback. So thanks everybody and have a great rest of your weekend. Bye now.